We are opening up the Locked On 49ers mailbag. The biggest subject of them all is the 49ers are losing a starter from 2021. Jaquaski Tart has signed a one-year free agent contract with the Philadelphia Eagles. All that coming up right now. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker with you here once again at BD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. If you're new to the podcast and you're just checking in during the off season, definitely slow season in the NFL, but we, we're still coming at you here uh, at least four days a week, five days a week is, is what we're still going to try to do throughout the off season before we get to training camp and, and things are ramping up full speed. If you don't know us, I'm Brian Peacock, uh, formerly worked in a lot of different places, doing content, doing um Football analysis, radio in the Bay Area, co-host of the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. My co-host here today and always, Eric Crocker, former AFL and NFL defensive back. He's got a an arena bowl ring that I hope. Did, did you find that ring yet, Croc? I found the ring. Okay, good. Right here. Yeah, arena bowl champion. Love that. Lots of bling on that ring. Uh, and the co-host of the Locked On NFL Draft podcast, right here on the Locked On Podcast network uh the first topic today croc is jaquaski tart because and i don't know how you feel about this one i think tart gets a a bad rap with 49ers fans especially how his career ended he's had a lot of injuries but really the dropped interception and i want to address that first before we get into what the 49ers defense is going to look like now without tart knowing that tart has now signed because i thought tart would be a signing do you remember croc when i asked you uh last friday's episode to end the week I asked you, what do you think the 49ers to-do list is, you know, for the next month or so before training camp starts? And two of the things that came to mind for me immediately was get on the horn with Jaquaski Tart and see what that's going to cost. Just make sure you're good at strong safety. Get on the horn with whoever, J.C. Treader, whoever. Make sure you're going to be good at center. Don't just cross your fingers and say, I think I like this guy that might step into a starter's role. Make sure if you want to go to a Super Bowl, if that's what your goal is this season, if you can fit it into the salary cap and – Tart, I don't know the details on that contract yet, but the fact that the numbers aren't out there means it's probably pretty low, and it's a one-year contract. So that's relatively cheap for a starter in the NFL, and that's where I'm at with the Tart thing is you know he is a starting caliber safety in the NFL. You might believe that somebody else on your roster is also a starting caliber safety in the NFL, but you don't know that for sure. So to me, Croc, is it unnecessary bit of a risk for the 49ers to not go out there and give Tart a, a very reasonable contract to make sure you have a starter, even if he gets beat out by, say, Talano Hufanga this year. You don't have to start him just because you signed him to a one-year deal, but make sure you've got that secondary locked down. Well, maybe that's how they feel, right? Like, maybe they feel like they do have it locked down. Maybe they saw enough from Hufanga last season, whether it was in games and maybe the progression that he made and then kind of leading into, you know, what he did at practice and – they just, uh, you know what, almost like what we've seen from Trey Lance, kind of that development curve and is heading in the right direction. I still, I get what you're saying, though, where it's like, well, at least with Tart, you know what he is. And I've been asked a lot over this past week from Philadelphia Eagle fans, hey, who is Jaquiski Tart? Like, you know, how good is he? Is he still a legit starter? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think he is a legit Starter, you talked about him potentially kind of getting a bad rap a little bit. I think a lot of it comes from just not being a playmaker. But one thing was very clear while watching a lot of Jaquesky Tart film, it gets boring because he just does what he's supposed to do. He's in the spot that he's supposed to be in. It's not splashy. It's not sexy or anything like that. But you need guys like that that just do their job. Obviously, you would love to see more forced fumbles. You would love to see more interceptions. But I think when you're just looking for good football players to fill out your roster, he's definitely that. The the thing that stands out to me from Tart's play and, and his skill set that I like, and it's something the 49ers do a lot, is they rotate their safeties around, disguise things. Uh, they like to bring Jimmy Ward up sometimes from free safety. They're not that strict cover three anymore, even though they'll run some cover threes. A lot of cover four. You know, there's a lot of, you could probably name, 
five different coverages that you see a lot now with the 49ers that you didn't necessarily used to see. But one of the big things is having a strong safety who can rotate with the free safety and go back and play the middle of the field, can play deep half. And that's the one thing I'm worried about with Hufanga. And we'll see how Hufanga turns out there uh, with Odom. The other, the free agent addition for the 49ers, uh, you know, great special teamer. I don't know if they view him as more of a backup. If he actually is competing, I do really think Hufanga's got a, a, a huge lead in, in being able to win that starting strong safety role. And if he doesn't, that means that, you know, maybe the 49ers got it wrong or Odom is just that good. But I don't know how Odom is going to be in that role if he has to rotate out and, and play, uh, play a little bit more of a, a free safety type role at times. So, that's where I worry, and that's where Jaquaski Tart was really good. Even though he's a 6'2", 220-pound safety, he had range, and he could legitimately switch out of there and go play free safety. And so that's the biggest thing that I knew I felt comfortable uh, comfortable about with Tart, and I don't know if the other guys can do that. And, you know, you have Tarvarius Moore coming off the injury, who's obviously got range at least, but then maybe he's less of the box guy. So, yeah, I'm not sure how this is all going to work out, but clearly, and I, I've got a lot of responses when I – when I um, when I mentioned that on Twitter right after the signing, I was like, man, this is maybe a, you know a little bit of a risky move for the 49ers not to bring Tart back on the cheap because the him being cheap is is a big factor in all this. Like that's a, f- a relatively free starter in NFL terms, and people are like, well, they like Hufanga. I was like, well, I know they uh, they didn't do it on accident. It's not like they thought, oh man, wait, we didn't sign Tart. I thought we had Tart signed. Of course they didn't. It wasn't an accident that they didn't resign. Of course they they have a plan and they like their guys, but. You know, a lot of teams have a lot of plans that go south in the NFL. So we'll, we'll see how it turns out. But clearly, the 49ers like their guys, and I think it is Hufanga. And and we'll see what kind of strides he takes in year two. And, and there's a lot I like about Hufanga as well. But I'm just saying the one thing that worries me is that interchangeability. Can you play the, the deep part of the field? You know, I think that's very key. And that's one thing that kind of goes a little unnoticed when watching the 49ers. I think they look at – their safeties and say, all right, you got Jimmy Ward and he's that rangy safety that is single high and, you know, obviously could play too high. Then, okay, you have Tart or you have Hufunga and those guys are more box safeties. But when you watch the 49ers, they definitely have to be interchangeable. Their, their box safeties or, you know, strong safeties play back in a single high or too high just as much as Jimmy Ward. Because the 49ers ask a lot of Jimmy Ward. He comes down in the box, plays man on tight ends. He plays man on slot receivers at different times. So when you actually just watch them play, and I saw this with Hufunga as well, even during the preseason, that was when I first noticed it. Like, damn, he sure is playing a lot of single high. With the 49ers, they need their safeties to be interchangeable. And part of that with them playing them there in the uh, preseason was seeing how well can he handle that role. And then obviously you see in the in, – the regular season, he did some of that as well. I think the bigger thing there is, can he play single high and not be an issue? Can he play single high and maybe the lack of, you know, big time athleticism, what we saw from Tart or Ward, does that like, you know, not show up, the lack thereof, right? So those are things that I'll definitely be keeping an eye on. If so, do they use him in a more safer role in the sense of, all right, he's only going to do too high, He's only going to play down, and if we do need another guy to play deeper, well, we have a third safety. Maybe it's Tarverius Moore. Maybe it's Odom. Maybe one of those guys take uh, control of a, a role like that that's very specific to their skill set that they can do a little bit better than what we've seen from Hufunga. Yeah, that's true that you can sort of interchange knowing you you tip your hand a little bit to the offense, them knowing, you know, what how you're going to align things. But if you put more on the field, you know, he's going to drop back, maybe play some center field, that type of thing. Uh, the other side of this, as far as um, n- not even as much as who's going to be the starter is, OK, you have f- how many safeties are on the roster right now? Like four. One's coming off major injuries. Tarverius Moore's never really become the guy they hoped he would be as a third rounder. Um Odom's never played a full-time role as a starter. He started some games and, you know, and looked good doing those uh, at strong safety for the Colts. And it's mostly a special teams guy, but all it takes is one injury. And, and now you're razor thin at safety too, because they didn't really draft safety. They drafted a couple corners, really deep at corner, not as deep at safety. So now you're talking, okay, we'll go. Maybe Dante Johnson has to make the team because you still need a fifth safety. Uh, and, and that's if Tarverius Moore returns from his, his injuries. We don't know what he's going to look like yet. So, it gets a little bit dicey. All of a sudden, oh, let's say Funga gets hurt and you got Odom and Ward. I mean, is more going to be so like depth is also an issue, not just who's going to be the starting strong safety for the 49ers to me. Well, I think any team, they they deal with that, right? Like most teams only carry four 
uh, safeties and maybe a guy that is a little bit more versatile, like we've seen from Dante Johnson. But, you know, practice squad, you might be able to stash the safety. That's where it's very important for a guy like O'Neal to kind of, you know, take strides in the right direction. That's a guy that's definitely – he does not lack confidence. I'll say that. Just kind of feeling the vibe of him, seeing things that he's putting out there on social media, how he believes in himself. That's awesome. Maybe he can be that fifth guy. I like that. That's that's really important for them to have that player on the practice squad. And they've had safeties on the practice squad every single year for that very reason. Someone that could jump in and perhaps play if needed because depth could become an issue with the 49ers at safety. Uh, good luck to Jaquaski Tart. He was a good 49er. I got one more note on Tart with the Eagles. That's something I think fans are def definitely getting wrong about Jaquaski Tart. And we'll dip into the Locked On 49ers mailbag after I let the folks out there know about Blue Nile. At BlueNile.com, you can celebrate all of life's special moments from creating the custom engagement ring of her dreams to gifting a classic and timeless jewelry piece. All prices you won't find at a traditional jeweler. There's two sides of this thing when you're talking about jewelry. You got your wedding jewelry, which is a specific thing, right? But there's tons of other reasons for every day. Find jewelry that you could buy that special person in your life diamond jewelry cocktail rings gemstone necklaces and no matter what you're looking for no matter whether you're ready to pop the question or just take your relationship to the next level even if it's not you know getting married or you're trying to buy a gift for mom or somebody else special in your life blue nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape size and clarity as well as setting style and Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft her the perfect engagement ring. And the best part, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7 to walk you through the process to find the perfect gift that you're looking for via phone or chat 24-7 to find a memorable gift in every budget. So make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On 49ers listeners will get $50 off purchases of $500 or more. This is a podcast exclusive that includes engagement. So use promo code locked on for that $50 off. Again, that is promo code locked on. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress free and find your forever peace. Go to bluenile.com today. Thanks again, everybody, for making Locked On 49 as your first listen. There is a live NBA draft. Show for Locked On, talking about the NBA draft on NBA draft night. So if you have a favorite NBA team, NBA team, make sure you subscribe to their Locked On YouTube channel so you get notified when they go live on NBA draft night. As the Warriors crock are having a, a parade right now as we're recording on Monday. Congrats to the Golden State Warriors. Crocker, you don't get to fight with... Uh, with your with cuz there's a lot of 49ers fans there's a lot of 49ers fans that are Lakers fans like you but most of the 49ers fans a bigger portion are Golden State Warriors fans and you've been fighting with them during the finals recently uh and unfortunately you don't get to do that anymore so you well, have any last last words for the the champion Golden State Warriors the dy the dynastic Golden State Warriors yeah man i mean very exciting for, to see the warriors win that championship i thought it was awesome i think it really helped kind of solidify Steph Curry is one of the best basketball players that we've ever seen. That was a terrific performance. I have seen some Warrior fans get a little carried away saying, oh, man, this was one of the greatest uh, uh, finals performances ever. And it's just like, dude, like, that's not even the best in the last five years. It's not even top two or three. Like, there's, like, a LeBron James amazing performance, uh, Giannis, uh, uh, <laughs> the Greek freak last year. I mean, he was, that was a big crazy. One. That was, yeah. I mean, there, there have been some like Kevin Durant with the Warriors, like his numbers were like off the charts. So there have been some great performances. But again, I don't think that takes away from the greatness of Steph Curry and how he has solidified himself with that. And but ultimately saying, hey, I don't need KD. And my beef with the Warrior fans is really more so because of them. Like, I actually like the Warriors. I, I think I like watching the Warriors. I love watching uh, Steph Curry. But it's just crazy that if you say one thing that goes against what they believe, which is, hey, man, look like, you know, Steph Curry's kind of flopping there. He's trying to get some calls. Oh, you don't know basketball. You don't know hoop. You, why are you talking basketball? Stick to the 49ers. Oh, you're a Laker fan. That's why you're hating. I'm like, damn, man, I just said it looks like he's 
trying to flop a little bit. Like, doesn't mean he's not great, <laughs> you know? So, like, that type of thing. It, it was almost like they kept egging me on because I'm going to push back. But I really am happy for the Warriors and happy for their fans to get that championship. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's huge for the 49ers. It's huge for... Uh, them to get that fourth in eight years that that thing is not over uh, for, you know, for, for the for the Warriors to have won pre KD and after I mean, I've seen some disrespect about KD because the KD stuff's not about Kevin Durant. The, the KD stuff's about the rest of the Warriors core and how good they are. And could they win without him? They won one before him. They won one after him. I think that was huge for the Warriors, huge for Steph, huge for for Clay and Draymond and Steve Kerr as well. But I've seen people be like, oh, well, KD at this point, it was just a bridge player between uh, between Harrison Barnes and Andrew Wiggins. It's like, okay, well, c- c- slow down. KD is a different a, a different dude. And so, like, but, yeah. It, it, that was he huge. was the finals MVP. And oh. not on some Andre Iguodala type finals MVP <laughs> stuff. It was like, he, he was the best player on the court. He was the best yeah. player on the court. Like, mm-hmm. and it wasn't even close. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of fans getting a little carried away. I've seen this a lot as it pertains to Jaquaski Tart, and I want to address it because uh, I think it's completely unfair to Tart, and it's just not accurate for the way that teams do business. Clearly, the 49ers have a plan at safety, and they're going forward without Tart this year. And there's a clear ways that it could work out great for the 49ers, and they do have some talent there. Um, I'm a little bit worried just because of, of how cheap Tart was that you know maybe it wasn't the – the right move, potentially. I don't say I don't want to say it's the wrong move, but you know, things could go wrong, things could go very right. But a lot of people responding to me said, you know, a they like they have a plan. They like they must like Hufanga. It's like, well, of course they have a plan. They like Hufanga, or else they wouldn't have done it, right? Like it wasn't an accident. But the biggest one that I've seen that that I will really push back on that is just flat out wrong. And um, I, I just saved this one tweet, but there was a bunch of them. This one's in all caps. Please don't tweet at me in all caps usually i won't read it but this time i will just because it was the angriest tweet and it it represented what i'm talking about the most he all caps here uh chublaka said when he dropped that interception against the rams in the nfc title game i figured they would not re-sign him if he holds on to that ball the 49ers go to the super bowl and he's still on the team i will say this tarts dropped interception had zero to do with the 49ers bringing him back this year because it's just not the way the teams operate. And I guarantee you the 49ers weren't in meetings talking about targets. Like, well, he dropped, he missed that one play. So we're going to change the entire direction of our secondary because of that one play. That's just not right. the way things go. Croc, your thoughts on the dropped interception. Is that the reason Tart is not with the San Francisco 49ers right now? No, not at all. I think it was just time. Remember last year, they gave him an opportunity to sign elsewhere too. You know, this is not the first offseason where they're like, okay, well, let's see with Tart. You know, last year was a little difficult for guys to catch on with free agents because of the dip in salary cap and, and the money that was available. So a lot of people kind of kept some of their guys, and 49ers were able to bring back Kawan Williams, Jason Verrett, and Tart as well. But they were going to let him go last year, and they were able to bring him back on the cheap this year. Same kind of scenario. They just didn't end up bringing him back, and I think they like what they have in – some of the younger guys. I also think that people put a little too much on, oh, that's the reason why the 49ers lost the game. Like the 49ers had several, several uh, uh, possessions after that drop pick. Now, did it did it help? <laughs> like, no, right? Didn't help the 49ers at all. Didn't do them any favors. And I would assume, you know, they have that one little thing where during the game it shows like which team has the better p- percentage chance to win. I think if you pick that off, it starts going up a little bit more for the 49ers. But again, you lost by three points, and you had several opportunities after that. I think they had two or three possessions, three possessions after the drop pick, and they just didn't do anything on offense. Like That's why the 49ers lost. Yeah, and if Tart doesn't make I think it was something crazy, like minus six yards in their last two possessions combined. It's scary. It's very similar to the Super Bowl, right? And it's funny because – (laughs) <laughs> the if Tart doesn't make other plays in other games, the 49ers aren't there in the NFC Championship game either. So you can't just like I know it hurts and I know what it's like to be a fan, but that's just not reality. The 49ers didn't let Tart, Tart walk because of one play. It just it just didn't happen. It's unfair to Tart. It's unfair to the 49ers. It's unfair to the whole thing. I know that hurts. I know it stands out to you, but that was one play in in, in a grand scheme of many many plays, and there's it's always more than one play. 
when it comes to uh, winning a football game and winning a championship. They say it's three plays. That's what they typically say. There's there's yep. three plays that really swing the game. And I do think there were some plays late in that game that definitely did not help the 49ers. One was obviously the drop pick. There was another one where, oh gosh, Jimmy Ward, like they gave up a, a play down the sideline and then Jimmy Ward just takes this like targeting hit or something on Odell Beckham, which he had been waiting to line Odell up. So he just was like, it was a little, it, it, it was a little undisciplined from Jimmy Ward, who he was taking that shot no matter what. And they threw a flag on that. You know, there, there were some things that definitely. Went I can't, did, it, did they have him stopped? Did that, did that move the chains or did that you know, just get they, they moved the chains with the, with the play, which it was like a 15 or 16, 20 yard gain. But then the hit, tacked on another 15 so it ended up being like a 35 yard play essentially. yeah it was like first and goal at that point and, and at a time where the rams you know they they were kind of struggling to really consistently get things going offensively yep it's been it's been tough for the 49ers um and we'll talk about if any of this is on head coach Kyle Shanahan on tomorrow's show. It's list season. So we're going to talk a little bit about where Kyle Shanahan is starting to, to rank on some of these offensive or this uh, off season lists. But it's funny because Shanahan's teams, the, both the Super Bowl run that ended short and the NFC Championship game run that ended short last year, they, they, they'll win a game for three and a half quarters and, 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 and can't finish it. And I think that's pretty common in the NFL, but it's just, you know, in under even more of a spotlight in those big games and Kyle Shanahan's teams, even going back to the Falcons, it's happened multiple times. So uh, we talked about how, how um, Steph Curry needed to win this championship. I mean, he was already cemented what he was going to be. This just helps that legacy for him and, and the, and the Warriors current core and current dynasty. But for Kyle Shanahan, he needs to go win a big one, right? I, I feel like Kyle Shanahan go, needs to go win a big one. And, and, and sometimes it's just the way the ball bounces, like the tart dropped interception. But that didn't guarantee they were going to win that game if he catches that ball. It is crazy because his legacy right now is that he can't win the big game. And you can point to several plays during the game where his players kind of let him down. And I think sometimes that's what it comes down to in the biggest of games. It's, I just need you to do your job, right? When he was playing against Tom Brady and they're in the Super Bowl and you have this play just dialed up and it is over. You called the right play and all of a sudden – your running back just whips on the block, and your quarterback who's thrown to a wide-open guy gets hit, fumbles, Patriots pick it up, return it for a touchdown. Dang, that's Kyle Shanahan's fault. Or late in that game when everybody talks about, oh, he didn't run the ball in that game and whatever, they throw it to Mohamed Sanu, I believe it was. He picks up a really good chunk of yardage, but, oh, no, and it was third down. They called holding, called the play back. Now it moved everything back, and it's just, oh, well, Kyle Shanahan's fault, you know, it's, and I'm not trying to dissolve him of any issues in some of these big games, but I don't think it's as simple as just, oh, Kyle crumbles under pressure, right? Like Jimmy Garoppolo, wide open throw. If he hits that, we're not saying that Kyle Shanahan's a choke artist. He overthrows a, a receiver, Kyle can't win the big game. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo throws a few passes. They get batted down by Chris Jones, who's an amazing defensive lineman. And one of those, it was like George Kittle, wide open. You know, the, the pass gets batted down. That changes the tra trajectory of the Super Bowl. Kyle Shanahan can't win the big game. So I think part of it, again, he has to take, you know, some blame for this. But I think it's a little bit overblown as it pertains to a guy that just can't win the big game. He has to, though. He has to get that monkey yeah, off his he, back. He needs to, maybe even if it's not reality, he needs to for perception and his own, you know, his own legacy. Um, next, we've got a couple more Twitter questions here in the Locked On 49ers mailbag to get to, but you definitely want to check in tomorrow's podcast. We're going to talk more about Shanahan, where he ranks amongst his peers as coaches and play callers in the NFL. But how about bet online? You want to bet on Kyle Shanahan that this is his year with a first year starting quarterback to go in the Super Bowl? You can get some odds on that at betonline.net, your number one source. For all your betting needs and sports information, find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs. I hope you want some money on those Golden State Warriors winning the NBA Finals, Major League Baseball all summer long, fights, uh, eSports, live betting, all the scores you could ever want, sports wagering information, and 
your favorite Vegas casino games as well at Bet Online. And BetOnline.net remains your best spot for. Uh, and we're not only talking wagering here, scores, news, and everything you can find about all of your favorite sports this season at BetOnline.net. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Multiple leagues of golf now to bet on at BetOnline. So get over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action at Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, Croc, do you have a good feeling? We, we've done, we're, there's still a couple of more undrafted free agents we got to talk about, but we've really started to d- dive into the roster a little bit. And we're going to do some training camp previews coming up here in July as we get ready for the 2022 season. But a question I've been waiting for here that now that we've, looked a little deeper at some of these undrafted free agents and some players fighting for the bottom of the roster. D case had a question a while back and I want to get to it now that says, do you have any early predictions for the biggest surprise player to make the 53 man roster? You know, it's tough for anything to be a surprise because everything is so well covered nowadays. And we always uh, give a bunch of different scenarios to, as to how something could play out. Like let's say the safety O'Neal. Right. We've talked about how we probably predict him be a practice squad player, but I think most people would say, well, yeah, but there's definitely an avenue for him to actually make the 53-man roster, right? So it's hard to have that surprise guy, but I would say, gosh, I mean, who at this point, who would be a surprise? Like, that, that's really yeah. tough. I mean, I think anybody who was not drafted, that's an uphill battle, and, and you should be surprised that an undrafted, especially where the 49ers roster is now. I think it was less of a surprise in 2017 that an undrafted free agent makes the 53-man roster, but at this point, every team in the NFL passed on a guy, didn't sign him, he signed with, and didn't draft him. He signed with your team, and you forget, because you look at your own roster sometimes, and and I think I'm guilty of this. And you think, oh man, I really like this undrafted free agent. You you gotta, he's gotta make the 53 man roster because if he doesn't, a team's gonna snap him up. But there's there's three 32 teams in the NFL that are all cutting 25 guys on the same day, right? And so that they like, and they are feeling the same way about their one guy because they've had him in. And so there is those occasions where guys do get poached after they get waived. But if you liked him that much. You would have, you know, unless he does something big in the preseason or you had some injuries, right, and it kind of changed your the identity of your team or what you were looking for post-draft or even late rounds of the draft. Um, in most cases, you are able to sneak those guys to the practice squad. It's very – and the other thing is, okay, well, so if O'Neal goes out and balls in the preseason, then it's like, oh, shoot, okay. He's put too much on tape, and teams are going to be looking at that, and they're going to see him. And they might have liked him enough already. But there was a lot of, you know, fifth-round grades on him from – uh, from draft analysts. So that's when you think, okay, well, Dante Johnson, we can cut him and maybe even have a wink, wink deal and be like, Hey, this other guy who's hurt that we can't cut yet. We're going to put him on IR after he makes the roster. Then we're going to cut sign you back, but we don't want to put Leon O'Neill through waivers or, you know, uh, Donovan West or Jason Poe through waivers. I, I think those types of names are the guys that I think have the best shot to make it as far as the undrafted free agents. But it's a good point because I, I just mentioned, what if Tarverius Moore isn't the same guy? And it's like, well, Okay you need a fourth safety still. So, and that's in your one injury away, even if you are fully healthy there. So uh, I think as far as those players, Leon, on, Leon O'Neill probably has the best shot. And then maybe one of the safe, one of the centers. And I would say probably Donovan West, just because he's played center and Jason Poe has been playing guard in college. Okay. Here's what would be a surprise. If one of the receivers make it right, like the Tay Martins of the world or uh, Keyshawn Johnson, right? Yep. Like nobody's I- expecting those guys to make the 53 man roster, but I know Keyshawn, Keyshawn Johnson. I feel like he's someone that can play. He played well at Florida state. Uh, he made the roster and had limited action as with the Cardinals, uh, during this time there, but you know, he can play. What if he just comes in and he grabs the offense and Kyle likes him and it's like, Hey, you know, we thought that this other person was going to be a Kendrick Bourne type player, but actually it's Keyshawn Johnson. Who's a veteran or Tate Martin receiver out of Oklahoma State we did a breakdown of him and that's a guy who I wouldn't expect to make the roster but if he does I think that would be a surprise to a lot of people including myself they there's space for a wide receiver too because if the 49ers break camp with six wide receivers there's really only five locks with no injuries five locks Debo and look, hopefully Debo's on the roster and like not in some weird, uh, you know, holdout mode at that point. But um, Debo, Brandon Ayuk, Juwan Jennings, 
Ray Ray McLeod, that's four. They drafted a third rounder in Danny Gray. He's going to make the team. There are no locks after five guys. Maybe they only take five guys on the 53, but they've been taking six wide receivers and sometimes seven wide receivers. So there's absolutely an opportunity for Tay Martin. Tay Sear Mack, we haven't gone over yet of the undrafted free agents. A couple of veteran free agents. You mentioned Keyshawn Johnson. Uh, there's also Marcus Johnson, uh, Malik Turner. And there's been some good reports you know, from here and there about those guys throughout the spring practices. Austin Mack is on the team currently. Um, there is, they got rid of, uh, Kyle Shanahan's boy. Who they? Who's the the wide receiver that um? Oh, they cut him, but he could be back too as well at some point. River uh, Craycraft. 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 Yeah, Craycraft got cut at some point around the first OTA or something after the draft. That was it was weird timing with that one. But there's there is for sure room for one of those players, and probably comes down to who's. <sighs> Who's available? I feel for those guys, man. Play some I feel for those teams. guys. I, I feel for the River Craycrafts of the world because we're talking about a guy who just. I think everybody just thinks these NFL players they just they're making millions and they're not. And when you're River Craycraft, who has played one like you, your active paycheck is much more than your non-active. Right when you're on practice squad, then you start talking about taxes and then just your expenses that you just have on a natural basis, whether you have a you know, pay for your Bay Area home, and then do you have a home somewhere else that, like, is your permanent residence? And, I mean, it, it can – you you get cut in your River Craycraft, there's not, like, just millions of dollars sitting in the bank account. So I always <laughs> feel for those guys, especially yeah. the timing of him being released. Yeah, and you're not renting a home in the Bay Area just waiting if you're River Craycraft. You're going somewhere else that's that's probably a lot cheaper. And then you've got to pay for – you're paying for yourself, right? Like, you – you're working out because you're trying to stay ready because you need to be able to answer that call if they call you again, which they've right. done multiple times with someone like Craycraft. And so there's a ton of those guys and you're spending money. You're like, do I go get a different job now? But I want to be able to spend time working out and being ready to, to, to answer the call if someone called me because you're this. And that's what's so tough for these guys. And Croc, you've been through that. You're this close. It's like you're this close to being like off an NFL roster and you're this close to being making those millions right like it, right. It, you're that close you need that opportunity one, you're, and you're not you're not hoping someone gets hurt ahead of you on the depth chart but that might but be you are. <laughs> one injury, right so uh, what a life that is and, and it's got to be stressful it's got to be stressful it, it is it's stressful and the, yeah the ex anxiety of it is pretty it's, it's up there i feel like i deal with stress fairly well but yeah there's there's nothing that compares to that and then the life after football element of it, which I have a buddy. Maybe we can bring him on at some point. I mean, he spent two off seasons with the Jets. Wasn't able to, you know, really latch on. Uh, was there entire preseason both years. And, you know, it's like, well, what, what's my dog doing now? You know, and he's just trying to figure out life after football because he never got a legit opportunity in the league. A couple other dark horse names to make the 53-man roster. And I'm going to watch more of Sam Schluter because I've heard some good reports from him from camp. Undrafted offense tackle. We spent a lot of time talking about the centers. So we still have some episodes, Croc, to crunch a little bit more tape and, and watch some of these undrafted free agents and get to know them a little bit better before camp. But Sam Schluter's a name I'm going to throw out there just because he's a, he's a tackle. And the 49ers don't have very many full-time tackles aside from Trent Williams. And Mike McGlinchey, if they're going to move Burford and Zakel both inside, which it seems like they're they're trying to do. Um, how about this name, though? I'm not going to let Jordan Matthews die. What about Jordan Matthews in his second full season being a tight end? You know, a little bit more juice as a receiver, some athleticism. Could he beat out Charlie Warner or, or Ross Dwelly for – probably Ross Dwelly because Warner is a little bit more of a, a blocking tight end. Yeah. Um, as an NFL veteran, someone that could make some plays in the passing game, he caught a 40-yard bomb, I think, from, from Trey Lance in one of those mini camp practices. What about Jordan Matthews, the tight end, sneaking in and making the roster, sort of the offensive version of Dante Johnson that just won't go away? I think that tight end three battle will come down to him – and Dwelly. I believe, I, I think Warner is more of a lock. It feels I think like he, he has a unique uh, niche. Like, you know, he's very good at this, which he's kind of that run blocking type guy, but he brings a little bit of a pass catching aspect to it. Maybe he goes down to the tight end university with George Kittle and Travis Kelsey, and all of a sudden he becomes this great pass catching tight end. I'm not anticipating that, but he definitely has his role on the team as opposed to Dwelly seems like it's 
whatever his role is would be similar to what Jordan Matthews' role would be. And I think there is a legit, you know, fight for that third tight end guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that Charlie Warner has been so good either that he's locked in necessarily, but just because you, the, most of the other guys we're talking about are more the receiving version, maybe the flexed out sort of a tight end. If if George Kittle goes down, Warner would be more of your your bl better blocking tight end, which which probably helps him in the fact that he's still on his rookie contract going into year three. Um, and then there's also Troy Fumagalli. There is uh, Tyler Croft. Those are guys that have played in the league. And so clearly the 49ers are bringing in competition for that third tight end spot. So that's a, I, I think that's an underreported training camp battle for tight end three for the 49ers for sure. And maybe it's Jason Poe. Who knows? <laughs> you can catch best hands on the team. Uh, all right. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, thanks everybody for making locked on 49ers. Your first listen Tomorrow, it is list season. Where does Kyle Shanahan rank in some of these offensive coordinator slash head coach lists that are going on in the NFL, including the PFF list that is making some waves uh, around uh, around the social media world? Croc and I back tomorrow for your second list, and make sure you're checking out all of the NBA draft coverage. Check out Croc doing Locked On NFL Draft. I actually want to talk to Croc about one of their latest episodes on tomorrow's pod here on Locked On 49ers. Of course, you can find me, uh, daily talking about the entire league on the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Croc and I back tomorrow right here. Lockdown 49ers.